Our next speaker is Professor Mike Grocott, and Mike hails from the UK. He is a Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Southampton, and he's also a consultant in Critical Care Medicine at University Hospital Southampton NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, Mike started off his career um, in internal medicine. He got his MRCP initially, and followed by his FRCA in 1999. Uh, then an MD in 2010, and he was elected Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in the same year, and he's a founding Fellow of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine in the UK. And that was in 2011. His research interests are diverse, and they include human responses to hypoxia, um, and in measuring and improving outcome following high-risk surgery, fluid therapy, and lung injury. He is the co-author of more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications. He is director of the Extreme Everest Hypoxia Research Consortium and leads the Fit for Surgery Research Collaboration. He has been on 11 high-altitude expeditions. He is an experienced mountaineer, and um, he's climbed in the Himalayas as well as the Andes. So in 2006, he led the Extreme Everest Chu Oyu, is that how you pronounce it, expedition, and an, another Everest expedition in 2007. So I'm really looking forward to this talk. It's Lessons for Anesthesia from Extreme Environment Physiology. Please welcome Mike Grocott. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, um, for the very generous introduction, uh, and thank you to uh, to Paul Burt for the invitation to, uh, to come here to speak on this topic, uh, the relationship of physiology in, in extreme environments, in particular at high altitude, to uh, anaesthesia. Uh, and, and also for giving the opportunity to visit your, uh, your beautiful city, uh, which I'm enjoying very much. I've been looking forward to coming here over the summer for uh, some months, but I have to admit that over the last two or three months, um, I've had this slightly mischievous wish that Paul would send me another email and, and ask me to give an additional talk, maybe a little bit more around the around communication or, um, or breaking bad news, because there's some such wonderful metaphors around. <laughs> <laughs> How, however, to try and redress this uh, grievous wound, uh, some of you will have seen the news this morning, and I must congratulate you uh, on James Spittle, who many of you will know is the... Uh, skipper of the Oracle Team Oracle America's Cup team, and he's just won the America's Cup. Australian skipper, he's won it for the second time, which puts him right up there with the greats of, of sailing. So, congratulations to Australian sport after all. So, the topic uh, to talk about today is physiology in extreme environments and lessons for anaesthesia, and I'm going to focus on three areas: um, human integrative physiology. Uh, the, the expeditions that I've been involved with, Caldwell Extreme Everest in 2007 and Extreme Everest 2 in 2013, earlier this year, uh, and then a, an, a, one of our uh, strands of clinical translational thought, which is, is oxygen therapy and how one might guide oxygen therapy. Uh, and uh, I will, I'll cover all these three areas, although, although not necessarily um, sequentially. And I'm going to start by uh, giving you a, a little bit of an introduction about extreme altitude. And I'm going to start with a short video. And this is of a climber close to the summit of Everest. Um, the individual uh, that you'll see, so there's an individual with a blue hat on, which you'll see about 20 seconds into the video, uh, is, is an elite athlete. So he's a fell runner in the UK, uh, certainly competitive at, uh, at county standard. So that gives you some feel for, for his level of physical fitness. Uh, and the video really demonstrates the level of disability that you see in individuals in the uh, oxygen low environment at extreme altitude. The, the, I apologize for the sound, it's a little bit noisy, there's a lot of wind on the microphone, but if you listen in the background, you can hear the, the respiration, the ventilation of the individual who's carrying the camera. This is, this is just below the Hillary step.
desperately slow progress at those last few uh, feet to the summit of Everest and the first view which you can still see there across to Tibet having climbed the mountain from the Nepalese side. So Everest is, you, as I'm sure you'll know, the highest mountain on the surface of the Earth, 29,028 feet or 8,848 meters. Uh, and it, it took a long time for us to understand whether humans would be able to climb to this uh, highest point on the surface of the Earth. There were a number of uh, attempts from the north during the first part of the last century, so the 1920s and 1930s, which were, came very close to being successful, both with and without supplemental oxygen, came to within a few hundred metres of the summit, but didn't quite make it. In 1950, uh, the Chinese invaded Tibet. The north side of the mountain was uh, abruptly closed off. Uh, Nepal, uh, on the south of the mountain, uh, clearly feeling nervous looking north at this a uh, huge colonial power opened up and people started approaching the mountain from the south. In 1952, the Swiss got very close to the top, uh, and as I'm sure you all know, in 1953, uh, Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay uh, successfully summited Everest. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Tenzing Norgay taken by Hillary. Uh, uh, Norgay could not use a camera, uh, so there are no pictures of, uh, of Hillary on top. And it's, it, it's an important picture because it, it highlights the fact that although they answered the uh, question as to whether humans could reach the summit of Everest, you can see that uh, Sherpa Tenzing is wearing an oxygen mask and, and they used supplemental oxygen for this ascent. And indeed, if you read Hillary's account, his belief was that it would not be possible to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen. He, he took his mask off for a few moments on top and, and felt uh, clearly pretty rough as a result. Uh, in fact, it took uh, a few weeks shy of 25 years to answer the medical and physiological question uh, which was when uh, these two uh, German-speaking Italians from the Tyrol, Reinhold Messner and Peter Habeler, successfully summited Everest without supplemental oxygen uh, in early May 1978. And they, uh, in doing so, became the 63rd and 64th individuals to summit Everest. And that kind of proportion remains true to today. So ar around 4% uh, only, about 4% of all those people who climb Everest do so without supplemental oxygen. Uh, and along with some other uh, pieces of evidence, I think that supports the idea, the notion that uh, the level of environmental hypoxia near the summit of Everest is very close to the limit of what humans can tolerate. Uh, and uh, an, ad an additional fact to support that is that uh, in winter, when the barometric pressure is, is just a little bit lower as it is everywhere uh, than in summer, uh, only one individual has successfully climbed Everest, and that individual was a Sherpa, and therefore probably uh, genetically advantaged in terms of hypoxia tolerance. So why did we go to Everest to do research uh, which was uh, about improving medical practice? What was the justification? Well, there are two reasons, uh, and I'll, I'll take the first uh, in the next few slides, and then I'll come back to the second uh, in a little while. And the first was that, it, that we believed that it was a reasonable model for understanding uh, some elements of critical illness uh, on the basis that uh, hypoxia, it's hard to think of critically ill patients uh, who are not uh, hypoxic. And with, with inflammation, hypoxia is probably the two principal mechanisms of, of injury uh, in critical uh, illness. The problem with critically ill patients is that, is that uh, they don't come like this. They're a very mixed group of patients uh, in terms of the illnesses they present with, in terms of the comorbidities they bring, and then in terms of the therapies that we uh, apply and the consequences of those. So separating out, trying to understand the effects of any individual factor uh, can be very difficult. For example, the, the uh, causes or consequences of, of levels of hypoxia. So we took a, an alternative uh, and in many ways simpler approach, which was to study healthy individuals progressively exposed to environmental hypoxia as they ascend to altitude, where the, the principal variable that's changing is the level of hypoxia, that there aren't all those other, other uh, factors changing at the same time. And that allowed us to study what's really the, the, uh, the, the meat of, of, uh, of what's going on, which is the variability between individuals at high altitude. Uh, and at one extreme, we have individuals like Mesner and Habler who can successfully, given sufficient time, uh, summit uh, Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. And at the others, you have individuals who will struggle to get to Everest Base Camp 4,000 metres lower at about 5,300 metres. 
Uh, and, and I put to you that we see a similar degree of variability. It is, it is so difficult to predict, uh, predict amongst the critically ill population who's going to do well and who's going to do badly. And it's that variability that gives us the, the signal that, that is of value to study. Is there anything at all to support the idea that, this, that uh, there might be some substance to this parallel? Well, uh, there is, and there was before we, uh, before we went to Everest in 2007. This is data from my good friend and colleague at UCL, Hugh Montgomery, uh, looking at the ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme, genotype. Uh, the, uh, the ACE, or a particular, the I allele of the ACE enzyme is overrepresented in endurance athletes, and conversely, the D allele is overrepresented in strength athletes. And if you look at endurance athletes who perform in a hypoxic environment, and these are elite high altitude climbers from the UK who've repeatedly ascended over 7,000 meters, uh, there is a strong preponderance of the I allele, such that very few of these individuals are DD homozygotes. And in the normal population, there's a perfectly balanced Hardy-Weinberg distribution, certainly in the UK, so about 25% II homozygote, 25% DD homozygote, and the heterozygotes are about 50%. So this is a strong uh, and statistically significant skew. If, on the other hand, you look at critically ill patients who suffer from what's probably our archetypal hypoxic illness, uh, so the adult or acute respiratory distress syndrome, there is a relationship between the same allele and survival. So individuals who are II homozygote, so the ones that seem to be doing better at altitude, have a mortality of around 10%. Whereas individuals who are DD homozygotes, the ones that are very underrepresented in terms of those performing well at altitude, have a mortality in excess of 50%. And both these sets of data have been, have been replicated by other groups. The clinical data there is from, uh, from UCLH uh, from the late part of the 1990s. So what's all this got to do with uh, anesthesia and integrative human physiology? Well, I think at the moment our identity as anaesthetists uh, is evolving, and, and perhaps at the moment we're, we're at a more rapid time of evolution than uh, we have been, at least in the recent past. Uh, and certainly in the UK, and I believe in Australia, the whole concept of uh, an expanded role of the anaesthetist as a perioperative physician being involved in the care of patients undergoing surgery both before, during, and after surgery uh, is uh, receiving a lot of attention, and certainly for our college and association, uh, it, there's a, now a major strategic direction to push towards uh, flagging up this role of the anaesthetist as perioperative physician. I think the other thing that we very clearly are, and possibly uniquely amongst our clinical colleagues, uh, is clinical integrative physiologists. We have this extraordinary role, both in the operating theatre and the intensive care, uh, of being able to administer uh, different drugs and watch the physiology change in front of our eyes and watch the uh, the consequences of, of the integrative physiology, so the interplay of the heart and the lungs and the circulation, uh, the neurological function, uh, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and we can often reverse the effects that we uh, induce by, by different drugs. And, and I suggest that there are very few other uh, physicians who have that opportunity. And I believe that the research that we're doing is human integrative physiology, uh, and I'll, I'll take you through uh, what I think the definition of that is uh, in, a, in a few steps and highlight why I think it's very important. So first of all, the human bit, and this is not to uh, play down the value uh, in many areas of science that we've gained from uh, research on animals and benchtop research, and, and they are clearly elements that need to run alongside uh, human study. But we have, particularly in, in critical care, had a long-standing problem in translating the results from animal studies into humans. Uh, it's, it's widely recognized, so there are, uh, across the whole of medicine, there are uh, major issues in the concordance between the results of animal and human studies. Mm -hmm. And in critical care, we have some particularly serious examples. So uh, we don't have to look too far back to look at uh, the withdrawal of Zygris, a drug that, that ultimately was proved to be ineffective. Uh, and when that uh, was withdrawn uh, towards the end of 2011, to me it was very reminiscent of a, an event at the very beginning of my career in critical care, uh, which was with the withdrawal of Centoxin uh, nearly 20 years earlier, um, both of which arguably are as a consequence of uh, uh, belief in the results of animal studies that subsequently did not translate into uh, efficacy in humans. 
And then there's the integrative element. And I think this is important because it, it's uh, uh, an evolution, I think, of our, uh, of our understanding of, of what physiology or how much we can get from physiology if we use um, modern techniques. Now, the, the term integrative in relation to physiology can mean a, a, a whole uh, bundle of different things. And I think the principal and important one is this holistic and systems-driven approach. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but, but people also talk about integrative in, in terms of bench to bedside and bedside to bench, so looking at a, a clinical phenomenon and taking that back and exploring uh, at, the, uh, at the bench how it occurred, looking across the life of course, uh, and pulling together multidisciplinary teams. But I think it's the, it's the holistic or systems-driven elements that are important. Uh, and these may sound like buzzwords, but actually the, the concepts behind them are, are uh, fundamental. And the, the most important concept is that, is that we probably do not live, or not probably, we do not live in a, a simple reductionist world. Uh, so the charming little duck at the, the bottom is the, is the cartoon model uh, of what you might consider a, a Cartesian world. So that the idea that if you, if you reduce everything to its component parts, you can actually understand how it, how it works. And actually, if you have the component parts and you stick them together, you can produce the, the final result. And that's clearly not true. You can't, for example, simply produce a human from the genetic sequence of a human. There are many other variables that, that come into play. And what we now understand, which actually goes right back to the, the kind of Arist, uh, uh, Aristotle physiology, is that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So there are emergent phenomena that simply cannot be predicted by observing the com different components of physiological systems, but can only be observed if you study the system together. And the obvious corollary of that is that if, you, if you're studying individual components on a, on a bench, uh, bench top uh, biochemical basis using cellular or simple molecular systems, you will not be able to predict some of these emergent phenomena without uh, looking at the consequences of those uh, mechanisms in the context of different physiological systems working together within the body. Uh, the, the picture there was uh, of um, Richard Nabel, who's a very eminent professor uh, in Oxford, who's a, uh, an exponent of this, and there's, there's a quote here uh, really uh, saying what I've said in the last, last moment or two, uh, pulling, pulling that together. But the, the key element that you cannot, that emergent phenomena uh, cannot be studied without studying the whole human. Uh, and there are elements of new technology which are allowing us to do this, and we're doing it in different ways, uh, and ways that we, we probably would not have been able to do and certainly would not have been funded to do only a few years ago. So we have uh, the ability to phenotype in great detail, and some of that phenotype is physiological, but much of it is biochemical. So we can now measure, uh, using all the omics-type disciplines, uh, genes, uh, epigenetics, uh, translation, so transcriptomics and express proteins, proteomics, and come up with vast data sets, uh, which then become very difficult to interpret. But in parallel to that, we have the development of computational biology and the ability to start to, to stitch these different data sets together, uh, looking at whole integrative human physiology. Uh, and then the concept that from that, uh, you can develop models, and there's an iterative process of model building. So you, you produce a model of what you believe human physiology to be. You test it with whatever your challenge is, hypoxia, for example. Uh, look at what that shows. Go back, re-experiment re in the humans, get more data, put that data into the model. Uh, and, and we are starting to see this kind of approach uh, yielding fruit. So what, what have extreme environments got to do with this? Well. One of the reasons that extreme environments are important is because they're one of the few opportunities to ethically challenge human physiology. So there are some drugs that we can give uh, reasonably safely. There is, there's an increasing amount of work, cautious work, looking at uh, infectious agents and physiological challenge. But uh, hypoxia, exercise, uh, low extremes of pressure and extremes of temperature are uh, conditions which uh, normal, which humans will voluntarily expose themselves to and which they can ethically be exposed to, which you can then look at the, the consequences in terms of integrative uh, physiology. And what might the clinical applications be? Well, from our, certainly from our work looking at hypoxia and the work we did on Everest, there are three key areas. Uh, I'm going to focus on the area of oxygen therapy, 
Um, but we're look, also looking at novel modulators of the nitric oxide um, pathway and novel modulators of mitochondrial function. So as anaesthetists, we all recognize oxygen as a fundamental drug, but it is arguably uh, the most fundamental drug that is prescribed. It's uh, arguably the most frequently prescribed drug in hospitals work worldwide, uh, and it's almost ubiquitous. If you think of uh, patients coming into hospital, it's a very rare patient who doesn't end up being administered oxygen for some of the time. Uh, it's pre prescribed, and these are UK data, I'm afraid, but it's prescribed uh, on a very large scale for patients with chest disease, and cardiovascular disease, and then if you look more focused on our own clinical area, uh, in the UK, uh, more than one million uh, major operations each year. All those patients get oxygen at varying levels, uh, more than 75,000 admissions to critical care. So a very high level of exposure to this particular drug. And we're all very comfortable with the concept that cellular hypoxia is harmful and it needs to be avoided at all costs but we're probably less conscious of the potential risks of, of cellular hyperoxygen, uh, which are an almost inevitable consequence of oxygen therapy as we currently give it. And there's a remarkable amount of data, uh, not necessarily uh, bang up to date, but the data where people have looked comparing hyperoxia with normoxia, it is surprising how harmful hyperoxia can be. And by normoxia, I mean just letting the patients have air. Worse than that, we, we do other things to uh, increase oxygenation, which can in themselves be harm harmful, and mechanical ventilation is probably the best example of that. So I'll run through these data quickly. Uh, uh, you may have seen them before, but, but if you haven't, they may be a little bit surprising. So this is a Cochrane meta-analysis of oxygen therapy in acute myocardial infarction. Uh, which, although it doesn't produce a statistically significant result, comes up with the conclusion that nearly three times as many people known to have been given oxygen following acute myocardial infarction have died compared to those given air. And there are ongoing, in the UK, there are ongoing clinical trials exploring whether actually we shouldn't be giving uh, uh, supplemental oxygen to patients giving acute MI. Uh, what I don't want to do here is, is change your practice to not giving supplemental oxygen. What I want to do is, is highlight the concerns that there may be and where we may be going, uh, given appropriate research in the years to come. The same is true in the very limited data that's available for acute stroke. So it's, this is a limited design. It's a quasi-randomized controlled trial, but it shows improved survival in patients given normoxia as opposed to uh, supplemental oxygen in acute stroke. And the same is true, this is uh, associative data, looking at uh, a large database base in adults following cardiac arrest, but again, uh, a difference in mortality, striking difference in mortality than those given uh, supplemental oxygen and not. And so there's been a development over the years uh, by a number of groups, including our own, of these, these concepts of permissive hypoxemia, uh, similar to permissive hypercapnia that we're all now used to, uh, and the idea of more precisely controlling arterial oxygenation, uh, coupled with the idea that maybe some of our patients may be able to acclimatize, more, more applicable to the critically ill who have sustained exposure to supplemental oxygen than those undergoing anesthesia. And it really it comes from the inevitable consequence of trying to avoid normoxia by giving supplemental oxygen, but, but not worrying about the upside where we not infrequently see patients with arterial PA2s of 20 or 30 or 40, and, and, we, are, and we feel unconcerned about it. We don't try to, to compress the upper limit of that range. Uh, and so we would argue there's an unmet need for uh, biomarkers of susceptibility and tolerance to both hypoxia, in order that you can understand how little oxygen you can give, and hyperoxia in order to avoid the potential harms of that. Uh, and this is from a review uh, published last year by our group in critical care medicine, um, putting forward a concept very similar to that which we're probably familiar with with fluid therapy of uh, a sweet spot in the middle of the dose range where you have maximum benefit with minimal harm and the recognition that with low oxygen levels and with high ox oxygen levels there's potentially harm. And then adding into that the idea that some individuals, uh, given some time to, uh, if you like, acclimatize, may tolerate uh, lower oxygen levels, so you might be able to move that uh, sweet spot a little bit lower uh, in individuals who are acclimatizing. And we've, this editorial will be coming out uh, in relation to anesthesia uh, in the next couple of months in the BJA. 
And so one of the translation elements that we see from our biomarker work looking at uh, large groups of individuals at high altitude is the ability to characterize signatures of susceptibility to and tolerance of uh, hypoxia in particular. Uh, and we think this may have utility in guiding a variety of therapies uh, in uh, anesthesia and critical care. So is there any useful evidence in anesthesia relating to the administration of oxygen? Well, you're probably familiar with the story about surgical site infection, and this was a meta-analysis from uh, four or five years ago now, summarizing the randomized control trials of uh, hyperoxia, so giving people uh, in the perioperative, uh, certainly postoperative, sometimes interoperative and postoperative periods, 80% uh, usually of, uh, uh, as an FiO2, as opposed to simply giving them 30 35%, which they might get with a routine mask system. And there was a strong suggestion of both a reduction in surgical site infection and, interestingly, in this meta-analysis, mortality, although many people discounted that because the figures were very small. We've had a large randomized control trial, the proxy study, uh, which looked at the issue of surgical site infection and found no difference. So the upper uh, red box there, no difference in surgical site infection and, and has really lowered interest in this area. And it also found no interest in 30-day mortality. And a lot of people saw that result and, uh, if you like, put this issue to bed. What they may not have seen, so this was published in JAMA in 2009. Three years later in anesthesia and analgesia was the follow-up paper looking at uh, mortality at, uh, on average, 2.3 years, uh, which showed a statistically significant difference in mortality between the normoxia and hyperoxia group. So the patients given hyperoxia were more likely to be dead two years following this intervention than the patients given uh, uh, hyperoxia, uh, and if the pointer works, so this is the overall data. This is the data for patients with cancer, and this is the data for patients without cancer. So if you have in this cohort, and it's uh, in excess of 1,300 patients, if you had cancer and you were given hyperoxia in the perioperative period, your chances of survival were greatly reduced. If you didn't, it appeared to make no difference, but certainly a striking finding and one that, that merits uh, further investigation. And our uh, approach, or if you like, our ambition, is to be able to characterize these signatures of, of good and bad adapt adaptation by pulling together uh, different inputs, so plasma biomarkers, different physiological variables, perhaps different genetic variables, uh, in order uh, to identify biomarkers of, of beneficial or, or adverse uh, uh, adaptation. And of course, those biomarkers will also uh, identify possible mechanisms that may be uh, amenable to uh, modification by other drugs. So let's come back to this question of why, why research on Everest, because there's been a long history of altitude research, uh, and you'd think that most of the answers were, uh, were already available. Uh, but one of the reasons we were driven to do this is because the textbook descriptions of how people adapt to altitude did not seem to explain the differences that you see between those that adapt well and those that adapt badly. So uh, to rehearse, uh, not to rehearse the concept, but to give you a flavor of the uh, values involved, when you ascend through the atmosphere, the barometric pressure falls. The proportion that is oxygen remains the same, and therefore the uh, partial pressure of oxygen falls uh, in the same degree as the barometric pressure. And it falls by a degree such that when you, receive, when you re reach Everest Base Camp, it's about half the sea level value. And when you reach the summit of Everest, it's about one-third the sea level value. So one-half at Everest Base Camp, one-third at the summit. If you're acutely exposed to those levels, uh, and the classic example of that is the James Bond acute decompression of a cabin when the villain shoots the window out, uh, most of us would be uh, rapidly dead. We'd lose consciousness within one to two minutes at uh, cabin cruising height of a, a commercial airliner, about 30,000, 35,000 feet, uh, and we'd die rapidly thereafter. And yet we know that individuals such as Mesner and Habler can successfully climb to the summit of Everest without su supplemental oxygen given sufficient time to adapt. So that acclimatization process is clearly very important. And it's classically been uh, described as being all about changes in oxygen flux. So uh, increasing the heart rate so that the cardiac output increases, uh, increasing Ventilation, so while your alveolar gas equation, your alveolar oxygen level increases, uh, increasing hemoglobin, so there's greater oxygen carriage, and increasing capillarity in the tissues, so that uh, the diffusion distance from any individual 
capillary down to a metabolizing cell is reduced. Now that's all true, but it does not explain the variability you see between individuals. It doesn't explain it at, an, at the level of individual variables or if you cluster them all together. And the best example of that is physical fitness. And physical fitness has no relation to your ability to tolerate altitude whatever. In fact, I'll show you the data in a couple of days' time, that it, there's probably an inverse relationship between physical fitness and your ability to tolerate altitude. So this is not all about oxygen flux. It's very counterintuitive. But if you look particularly at Mesner and Habler, um, who were studied in great detail during the 1980s when they returned from Everest, uh, the most remarkable thing about them was how unremarkable they were. So this data uh, in red is high, is, this is VO2 max, but you can look at it across a whole range of physiological variables. The, red, the triangles highlighted in red are the two of them plus three other elite European climbers. The non-highlighted triangles are uh, five Sherpa climbers who'd summited Everest. And the boxes highlighted in green are the controls who are essentially Swiss couch potatoes. And there's no difference between the controls and these, these individuals who had performed in an extraordinary way at high altitude. Even worse for our classical explanations, and this is our data from 2007, uh, the amount of oxygen being carried in the blood is at least normal in well-adapted individuals, and yet they are dramatically disabled. So if you focus solely on the darkest bars in these graphics, it's uh, total oxygen content, uh, and uh, we're looking at across from, uh, as you look at it, from uh, left to right, sea level, Everest base camp, 6,400, 7,100, and 8,400 meters. And you can see that right up to 7,100 meters, so the sort of altitude you only see in the Himalayas, nowhere else on Earth, oxygen content is at least as, as high as it is at sea level. And in fact, at the lower altitudes, it's greater than it is at sea level. And yet oxygen consumption is substantially reduced by about 33% at base camp uh, and an even greater degree at 6,400 meters where the oxygen content is even higher. And so, excuse me, wrong button. Uh, and so our hypotheses were that the changes that we would see uh, in function would be explained not by, uh, if you like, macro oxygen carriage or oxygen delivery as we often refer to it, but by tissue factors, in particular by the function of the microcirculation and the function of the mitochondria, the, uh, the cellular organelle that is actually metabolizing oxygen. And I'm not going to show you much of the exercise-related data today because we're coming back to that in a couple of days' time. An important element of that is the, is the decoupling of oxygen delivery, uh, as, as we refer to it, oxygen flux, uh, and oxygen utilization, the ability to metabolize oxygen. And we see the same in critical illness. So we have this uh, dichotomy between acute phase illness, fight or flight, increased cardiac output, lots of catecholamines around, and the with, a, with increased oxygen consumption, and the chronic phase of critical illness where we have decreased oxygen consumption uh, and something more akin to, to hibernation, uh, if you like. And if you look at interventions in those contexts, uh, and these are just two examples, uh, this is the Jonathan Wilson paper looking at optimization of uh, perioperative patients and uh, Michelle's study of a similar approach in critically ill patients. Uh, if you optimize perioperative patients, the data says that it improves their outcome. If you optimize critically ill patients, it either makes no difference or indeed, as Michelle Hayes showed, uh, causes harm. So there is, there's a difference in response to the same type of treatment in different clinical contexts. So back to uh, some of the nuts and bolts of doing this kind of research at altitude. It has its risks, and so one of, our, uh, uh, one of the things we did right at the very beginning was set up clear priorities with safety first. You, you can't go to altitude to do medical research and, and harm someone in the post process, and then science, and then the, the climbing only in so much as it allowed us to get uh, novel data. We did a huge amount of work before we went to Everest over three years um, validating different elements of the measurement equipment. So these are uh, a hy hypobaric and hypothermic chambers. They're the, they're the rather simple end of it. So the hypothermic chamber, uh, which you can see uh, in these two pictures, is, is in fact a butcher's van, which was lent to us for free and will go down to min minus 25 and was parked in our laboratory car park for some weeks. And the uh, hyperbaric is not the most high-tech facility. Uh, rather, it's the, uh, 
It's owned by a balloon technologist who's one of these guys who advises people who do high altitude, long distance high altitude balloon uh, journeys, uh, the likes of Richard Branson trying to go around the world. And he has this thing which is about 60 foot long, 12 foot in diameter in his farmyard, and we went to use that. So before we went to Everest, we'd validated every single device to more than 9,000 meters, so higher than the summit of Everest, and down to minus 25, which is about the sort of temperature you'd expect. We also made sure that all the people would be up to it, and we ran two separate expeditions to Chuo which is the sixth highest mountain, 8,201 meters, during 2005 and 2006. Uh, put 18 people on the summit, from which we chose our Everest climbing team uh, of 10. And that was to ensure that the doctors and scientists that were doing this would be able to conduct the science when they got uh, high on Everest. It was logistically relatively complicated. This is part of the spreadsheet which governed who was where during different parts of the expedition. So these are the individual members of the expedition. These are the different subgroups uh, by location for the entire expedition. And these are the 200 trekkers that we had who were our volunteers, uh, along with uh, the film, one of the two film crews and the two groups of children that we studied. And this was all mapped out well before we left, and we followed it to the letter. We shipped out 26 metric tons of equipment, uh, more than 400 of these blue plastic barrels, more than 100 cylinders, uh, to Kathmandu, and then, and then onwards to the different laboratories that we had uh, higher up the mountain. Uh, and our five-person logistics team did an absolutely perfect job. We, we never at any point were unable to find things on the huge, uh, using the huge spreadsheet that we had describing what was in each barrels, barrel. And I sometimes sitting on call, waiting for a piece of equipment on our intensive care unit, reflect on that experience. <laughs> this is the uh, environment in which we are working. So you can see the Sherpa capital, Namshi Bazaar, down here, and then the, tra the trail ascending slowly up to round behind here, and ultimately the summit of Everest up there. Uh, and the ascent profile uh, was, uh, you can see the trekkers in a dashed line. There were 200 of them ascending at exactly the same rate at, at different times, but over with the same timetable. And that was the great strength of this study, that we had 200 individuals with the same pattern of altitude exposure, where differences in physiology we could with confidence attribute to differences in, uh, in their own physiology, as opposed to difference in their exposure. The climbers ascended excuse me, the climbers, the climbers ascended slightly more slowly, so we didn't compare the climbing investigators with the uh, the climbing subjects, sorry, with the, the trekkers, uh, but they, in smaller numbers, ascended very high, indeed, some of them to the summit of the mountain. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting trip up. It's a standard commercial airline to Kathmandu, but then a much smaller plane from there to the airstrip in Lukla. Uh, and this, this was one of the, uh, from the trekkers' point of view, one of the worst bits of the whole trek. They were still talking about this two weeks later when they got to Everest Base Camp. You trek from relatively low green, a relatively low green environment up through the Sherpa villages to the glacial moraine and finally to Everest Base Camp, and you can see the Kumbu Ice Wall behind there. Uh, and at Everest Base Camp, we had a fully functioning laboratory that could do essentially anything that you'd expect to be able to do at, at sea level, so uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, arterial blood gas measurement, cardiac output measurement, a whole variety of different techniques. This is one of my favorite pictures, uh, in fact the bottom of it I think has just dropped out, but it's a picture of, uh, excuse me, of a very good friend and colleague of mine, Chris Imray, who's a, a vascular surgeon, professor of vascular surgery, uh, and the under, other individual there is my wife, who was also on the expedition, uh, and she's an anesthetist. Uh, and you can see the pleasure of an image of an anesthetist removing small chunks of muscle from a surgeon. <laughs> uh, this is the sort of data that we got, so this is a photomicrograph. Um, EM of one of the skeletal muscles. This was the first one we got back, uh, really to ascertain whether uh, the data would be of sufficient quality. Uh, and the email came back, uh, the preparation is excellent, the individual is deeply deconditioned, which was slightly distressing to me because it was my leg. <laughs> uh, and these are the sort of analyses. Uh, so this is part of the proteomic analysis with complex statistical factorial uh, uh, subsequent analysis which showed us that there are 23 specific proteins amongst those who had muscle, muscle biopsies which are either upregulated or downregulated, and these are some of the clues to push us to looking at which mechanisms are likely to be important. Above base camp, we had two 
fixed camps at Camp 2 and Camp 4, Camp 4 being the South Col and two overnight stops, uh, ascending through the icefall. Uh, this, this mess here, you can just get for scale, you can see two climbers. This mess here is one of these that's just fallen over. Uh, and we ascended as rapidly and as few times as we could through the icefall uh, along the fixed ropes uh, over the crevasses, which lended some fairly unusual views. Uh, up, uh, you know, we didn't like the views. That our, our camera crews absolutely love the views and would go backwards and forwards to get extra images. Up to Camp 2, where again, fully functioning laboratory with 240 volt electricity, uh, uh, making all the same sorts of measurements. Uh, and then beyond that, up the Lexi face, past Camp 3, to the South Col, uh, fixed ropes all the way, uh, to a much simpler a laboratory, but still able to make most of the measurements that we wanted up at uh, a few metres shy of 8,000 metres. We, uh, in addition to the 10-person climbing team, we had a five-person climbing support team to deal with, a, with what we expected to happen and did happen, which was the various medical calamities that we were uh, called in to be involved with. So we were able to deploy those individuals to do that and keep the core team focused on the, the job in hand. And this is one of the rescues we were involved with of a 19-year-old uh, Nepali girl who was found hypothermic, frostbitten, uh, and unconscious, about 8,400 metres, and over a period of a week was rescued down to base camp uh, and subsequently got back to Kathmandu and fully recovered by the, the end of one thumb. We... Uh, we did a lot of science in the south column. We then had one additional measurement that we wanted to make higher up on the mountain, and that was measurement of arterial blood gases uh, in individuals close to the summit to get a, a feel for how low the level of oxygen is in individuals who are close to the limit of, of tolerance. So you climb through the night. We started at uh, 9.30 in the evening. Uh, at about 5 in the morning, the sun comes up. It gets a little bit warmer, uh, and you can see where you're going, which I thought was great. Dan Martin, he's a good friend and colleague of mine who I was climbing with said it was terrible because you could also see the way back down again. Uh, we got to the south summit at about uh, six o'clock in the morning and you can see uh, the Hillary step here uh, highlighted uh, and we got to the summit about uh, half past six in the morning. Unfortunately it was still very cold, it was very windy, it was about minus 25 degrees and 20 knots of wind uh, and so we decided not to uh, take the blood gas uh, on the summit but rather we descended uh, about 400 metres to a place known as the Balcony, took four arterial samples there, and they were run down by our Sherpa colleague, Passang, uh, 2,000 metres to the camp at Camp 2, where we've got mains electricity and a bench gas blood ma gas machine, which is fully calibrated, uh, and there we made the measurements uh, that I'll show you here. So if we plot, plot it here, this is different. This was, we were very fortunate for a, uh, a paper that essentially has four subjects in it to get this published in the New England Journal of Medicine. On the horizontal axis, uh, PaO2 in kilopascals. On the vertical axis, PaCO2 in kilopascals. And the blue values are sea level, which would be similar to any of us in this room at this moment. The threshold that I think most of us start get to get excited about hypoxemia and uh, anesthesia and critical care is probably around eight. So we'll, we'll turn up the oxygen, we'll intubate, we'll turn up the ventilator. All our subjects at Everest Base Camp were comfortably low that value and all of them were functioning pretty normally. So their physical capacities are down by about a third, and subtle elements of neurocognitive function are impaired, but if you met them, you would not tell that they were not functioning normally. As you go higher and higher, the PaO2 gets lower, as does the PaCO2 as a consequence of the hyperventilation that occurs at altitude. So this is 6,400 meters, somewhat fewer subjects at 7,100 meters, and the highest measurements in altitude, lowest in terms of PaO2, uh, values between two and four kilopascals, so between 15 and 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, with an average around 19, 20 millimeters of mercury, uh, in normally functioning individuals who are talking fluently. Two of these individuals, in fact, the highest and the lowest values were the two that took all four of the, the samples. All of the samples were first pass uh, blood gases from a fem femoral artery, but functioning essentially normally with PaO2s between two and four. And it harks back to Joseph Barcroft, who in the 1930s suggested that uh, this concept of Everest in utero, that, that humans near the summit of Everest would be functioning at the same sort of level, level as the fetus in utero. 
and, and I'm, I'm certainly not a neonatologist, but it is intriguing that the threshold for uh, thriving or not thriving for the fetus is about the same sort of level. So around 2.5 kilopascals is the threshold for the fetus in utero to five, thrive or fail to thrive. And if you look at diving mammals, they will tend to surface with the same sort of values in their PaO2, which takes us back to this concept of uh, permissive hypoxemia uh, and whether if, if we could tolerate values that low, now we were well acclimatized over a long period of time, we're probably a selected group of individuals, but whether we could tolerate uh, values lower than eight as a threshold value for augmenting treatment in, in many of our patients. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully I've convinced you that there is the potential, potential for translational science from this type of endeavour. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you.